Hello everybody, my name is Amul Patel, you're watching the Smoking Hot Coffee Show, where every day, Monday through Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we talk to startup founders and people from the startup world. I'm joined with... Hey guys, I'm Jeff Pelton down here in San Diego. And so today we got an incredible uh, interview with the Foundation.com founders, Dane Maxwell and Andy Drish. Uh, both of these guys have been on the startup scene for uh, several years now, and uh, they run an organization that trains and almost therapeutically helps uh, budding entrepreneurs, software entrepreneurs, launch businesses. You don't need an idea, you don't need money, uh, you don't need to have the skills, and they're still able to churn out successful entrepreneurs. Uh, it's incredible, Jeff. It, this is just an uh, incredible idea. The fact that these guys are actually doing it and they've got successful students to come through, mm -hmm. uh, it just blows my mind. Uh, Jeff, tell us a little bit more about the foundation. Yeah, it's great. It's a six-month course, and it happens virtually where you all gather online. And like they said, uh, six months is enough time to really get you immersed in the community, to really get a transformation on the way that you think. Which, you know, for the entrepreneurship, it's hard when you're alone and uh, doing this and uphill battle every day and you have your, your downs and, uh, you know, it's really important to have that support group and like-minded people uh, around you to, to help you get through it. And so it sounds like a, a really amazing opportunity for people to uh, really change the way that they're thinking and, uh, you know, change the way that they're living, not just in their business, but, uh, you know, in their, in their lives. No, and, and Jeff, I think you hit upon it, the idea of changing your outlook, just the way you perceive the world. Uh, you you mentioned earlier that you'd seen The Pirates of Silicon Valley, which is an old uh, late mid-90s movie about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and that whole thing. And, and Steve, had some, Steve said something about the fact that everything that we see around us, uh, that we, you know, generally like our houses, our cars, or the, the furniture, the stuff we eat usually, it's all being made by somebody. Somebody brought it to life, somebody uh, created it, and uh, a lot of times they're not that much smarter than you are. So uh, why not go out there and build something and, and co-create the world that you're existing in? And in my point of view, uh, the foundation is doing exactly that. They're going in, they're finding what the pr problems are in the world, and they're solving it uh, through software and, and helping uh, create a better world for all of us. Yeah, so not to trivialize the pursuit, you know, the, the entrepreneurial process of creating, you know, internet software, for instance, uh, you know, they make that easy and really unlock the difficult part is kind of overcoming your own fears and challenges within yourself. And, uh, you know, there's really no way to explain it uh, besides letting them. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you're going to get a little bit of that on, uh, on this interview. Uh, they talk about how kind of uh, the pitfalls people fall into, um, the mindset shifts that need to happen. Um, and uh, toward the end of the interview, I even talked about an issue that I'm having, and they did a little uh, a little uh, therapeutic uh, exercise. help exercise at the end of that, so that was it was interesting. Um, in general, guys, I think if you're remotely, um, you know, if you've got a, you know, if you're working somewhere and you don't have a lot of time, um, and you want to start something on the side, but you don't have a great idea, you, you've got some other hangups, maybe you don't have enough money, maybe there's a lot of uh, things that are going on and you just don't know what to pick and what to prioritize. Uh, we talk about a successful student of theirs. We bring the product up on on our screen so you can actually see it. And this guy used to work for Tesla, and now he's making three thousand bucks a month, and it's steady. It's you know, subscription revenue, and uh, it's really exciting. They showed us another product, and I saw this stuff, and yeah, I couldn't help but think, "Oh my God, this is so great! It's like the Holy Grail." So uh, you don't, you know, I, I'm happy if I'm making five, ten, twenty grand a month. That that's 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 great. That'd be great. I'd still probably do smoking hot coffee, but. Uh, uh, it's just really awesome that these guys have got a working formula. It's not like a get-rich-quick scheme, and uh, it really works. So uh, definitely check out this interview if you want to learn more. Absolutely. I'm going to listen to this one a couple more times. Uh, there's so much good stuff in here, and it's just motivation and inspiration for all of us uh, you know, trying to make it. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, uh, please, uh, uh, you know, if you like the show, subscribe to us on YouTube or on iTunes. Uh, reach out to us uh, via email at info at smokinghotcoffee.com. Jeff? Yep, please subscribe, guys. It um, makes our day, and email us and let us know how we're doing and what else uh, you'd like to see on the show. Great, and so with that, let's cut to the show. Hey, guys, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. How are you guys doing? What's up? It's incredible. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Appreciate it. You're welcome. 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, can you introduce yourselves and, uh, you know, tell us a little about uh, Foundation.com? Well, uh, usually I like to have the interviewer introduce us, if you would be so kind. Oh, I'd be happy to. <laughs> so today we've got Dane <laughs> Maxwell. Say hello, Dane. Hey. And we've got Andy Driss. How you doing, Andy? Awesome. I think you and should... Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we're... I've been a big fan of uh, the stuff you guys are doing at the foundation. For those that don't know, uh, tell us uh, a little bit about the, what, what you guys are doing with the foundation. Okay. Last time. Okay. Uh, with the foundation, uh, we, the foundation is basically a six-month incubator who, for people who want to start software businesses, but they're starting from nothing, meaning they don't have an idea to get started. They don't have any coding skills or expert status. Uh, they have limited cash to invest into a business, and we help people do that over the course of six months. But ultimately, like that's that's the reason people come join us. Uh, right. But the, the what people actually get out of it is uh, a completely a, a massive shift in their identity and the way that they look at the world. A new life and what they believe is possible, what they believe about themselves. They end up having a community of people who. Uh, who have their backs in all areas because I think one of the hardest things is just being lonely as an entrepreneur and, and it's finally like it's home for those people who just feel like misfits. That's what it is. That is a lot, Jeff. Uh, what do you that's, think? A, that's a big vision. A lot more than just an incubator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. incubator is really not a great word for what we're doing. Gotcha. Wow. You, you know, I, I'm glad that you're bringing emotional words in there. You're talking about the loneliness. What What have you uh, have you found? A lot of software guys, soft, people that are trying to start ups, they tend to be isolated. Is that what is Is that a common theme? In most of these entrepreneurs that come on, if they're not isolated, um, like mechanically, like meaning there are people around them, they're typically feeling isolated. So okay. you have the guy who's you have the guy who's all alone maybe in his office, but then you have the guy who's not all alone, but he still feels all alone. Um, and so is the isolation is, is very common. I think I think us as entrepreneurs, uh, I think it's it's a rite of passage you go through at some level of feeling so alone. Like you feel like the black sheep. Like you feel like everybody else is is just following this pattern and that you're different and you don't know why and that they're believing these things about the world and you're just like, this is insane. I remember being in corporate America and just being like, this this can't be life. This can't be how it's supposed to be. And, and you have this like truth inside of you, uh, but you just don't have other people who share that same truth. And then when you find a community like that, uh, everything changes. There's a comment on, uh, we're doing an Ask Me Anything on Reddit with one of our successful students, and he's blowing up. Okay. Uh, he had over 200 questions or comments. Or 300. Or 300 yeah. now. On, on Reddit, uh, people that are just yearning and, and, and almost like falling over themselves for this information that we have, which is not to, to like doesn't feel very profound to, to me personally, but that's just because I've been doing it for six or seven years. But to see this, these 300 comments, uh, absolutely insane how much people are desiring this kind of path to create freedom in their life. Of a, of a recurring revenue web-based product, whether it's software or not. Now, there's a video on that Reddit post, and below that video, there's a comment, and the comment just like poof, just hit me hard, so hard yesterday. And the comment was, a guy says, "I think I've just found what I have didn't even know I was looking for." And so there's Andy's talking about this thing where he's like, "This there's got to be more," but he doesn't really know what he's looking for. And then you find the foundation, and then you're like. Oh, I found it. This is what I've been looking for. That's great. And, right. and that's that's the feeling that many of the uh, people in our community create. In fact, the throwing a birthday party tonight, and four or five of the of the more successful students in the foundation are coming to that birthday party, flying in to hang out with us, just because like they just love community so much. Wow. Yeah, and the, the community yeah. speaks a lot. You know, we talk to a lot of people like, uh, you know, Mike from AdBeat, I think, moved from Phoenix to San Francisco for the community. Like, he felt like he couldn't get that uh, where he was, you know, but that's a big city, right? So, yeah. you know, how, how uh, much can you speak to the geography in the community? I mean, we're online all day at our desks. We feel connected, but 
somehow we miss it sometimes. Go for it. I don't know. I mean, it, it's community. It's it's there. There's definitely something about being in person and how that changes relationships. Uh, but I think what a lot of people are missing are uh, a, a group of people who believe in each other and uh, a group of people that you can just be open and honest and real with. And when you're having a shitty day, you can go to them and be like, you know what? This fucking sucks today, and I feel awful, and I'm getting rejected over and over, and I don't even want to make another call. Or I don't even want to do another thing. And having people that you can just – who are going through that process with you, who you can just kind of go to battle with and uh, and have each other's back as you're doing it. Dude, I think you nailed it, man. This Because building a, a software is one thing, but getting out of the room, getting out of the house, actually talking to customers – Interviewing people is oh, it seems like such a big uh, hurdle, uh, yeah. and and just getting rejected, getting rejected because a lot of it is a little bit of the sales, you know, bit, yeah. you know. Uh, so l let's g let's get into it. Like so, what, uh, let's go into some of the questions, the, the customer development part of the foundation. What kind of what are the, some of the key questions that you found have really unlocked uh, a lot of value for your entrepreneurs? While Andy was talking on the previous question, I was thinking about, I feel like when people come to find a community of entrepreneurs, and you know, you can still be lonely around entrepreneurs, because I would say um, hmm, out of a thousand people, you might meet 50 entrepreneurs, and out of 50, that's maybe generous, and out of 50 entrepreneurs, you might actually meet 40 entrepreneurs that don't actually resonate with the belief structure you have on, on, on entrepreneurship. Um, you know, it might be the guy that's running a gas station or the guy that's running a clothing store. And they have no desire to, just to grow, be, just, just, just to stay there. Um, and then, but then you find this subset of entrepreneurs who just value freedom and, and above and beyond anything else. And it's when you find those entrepreneurs that that value freedom, it's when your heart can rest. Uh, because I think really entrepreneurships, if they were actually really sitting and they were able to articulate how they felt, it would be like there's this aching in your heart for finding home. And home is typically in community. And it's in community with people who value what you value. And it's very hard to find entrepreneurs who really truly, truly value freedom. Um, with that in mind, customer development <laughs> question. Okay, all right, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I was thinking as Dan was answering, I was like, I love how I love how you ask the question, and he doesn't even go <laughs> on the pad at all. <laughs> no, no, you know what? Actually, um, we can we can actually get into that a little bit later. This, this I, uh, the whole idea of getting becoming an entrepreneur, feeling lonely. Uh, going through the big hurdles of talking to actual potential customers, it's, it's, uh, this is a great topic, so I'm yeah. glad we're covering. On, on the topic of freedom while we're talking about it, like yeah. freedom isn't, isn't, you know, I used to think it was in the sense of the four-hour work week, like no. freedom to travel and to play and do whatever the fuck I wanted to, and, um, and I did that, and I went to Breckenridge, Colorado and learned to snowboard, uh, and I felt very like free in that sense, and I felt lonely and sad and just like, completely isolated. And so freedom in the sense of being free to like be who you are in the world and right. being free to do, uh, do what you feel called to do. And, and generally I think uh, for a lot of people that is you know, being in service at some level, like being in service of others. Right, um, yeah. So, so freedom in, in that aspect, not, and, and it's nice at times to have the freedom to go play. Like, you know, a lot of our, like we said, 20 some people are flying in this weekend to come hang out and having that freedom, but also having the freedom to work on the projects that are most inspiring to you. And that's, what's really exciting. Yeah. I, I mean, what you said about being able to speak freely to your peers around you and having those people around you that you feel open to be, uh, you know, open about your daily ups and downs is, is a uh, you know night and day difference for most people, right? I mean, is that yeah. the, the biggest difference people feel when they come into the foundation? They say, just wow, like if, you know, my heart's opened up, or I've just sort of uh, changed my perspective because you know the people around you are resonating with you. I mean, uh, the, you know, it's hard to find because entrepreneurship alone is hard enough to find, and then the <laughs> subsection of it that you're talking about is, you know, even harder to find. If you were to make it really concrete, the 
the foundation community. Uh, imagine being in a chat room and having someone be like, oh crap, you guys, I can't hire a VA. I don't even have a hundred bucks to my name right now. And then having someone else come up and be like, hey, what's your PayPal address? I'll loan you a hundred bucks. Uh, that's great. You know, uh, or, 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 you know, 37 or 40 of the past foundation class are so in love with each other and they miss each other so much that they've organized a private meetup in Boulder, Colorado, where they're just going to hang out because they all miss each other. Right. And I've never seen anything like it. So cool. Wow. And this, the foundation was really created so uh, a number of reasons, but the one that's most present right now as we're talking about this is that I just wanted friends. <laughs> you know, and like, and like I couldn't yeah. find. I couldn't find. Come on, Dane. Friends. You gotta have some friends. You don't. What do you need more friends for? <laughs> Well, fa fair enough. That that's a completely different situation now. Uh, but Dane, when you, at twenty six, I've not. Well, I mean, that, that's Dane and I met each other five five years before we went into business together, and we, we met each other in the context of like, holy shit, like there's somebody else. Dane was the first person I met. I was doing all the blogging stuff, and he was the first person I met who was you know close to my age that was actually running a successful business, um, with like dollars and cents going into a bank. You know, I was so worried about getting Facebook fans and Twitter followers and stuff at the time. And uh, and our relationship really started in that context of like, wow, there's other people out there like this. Uh, yeah, and what I'd like to move the direction of this interview, if you guys are okay with it, is we're talking about freedom. And so um, freedom is 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 like there's there's physical freedom and financial freedom and time freedom, but the kind of freedom that's most important to me is emotional and mental freedom. And anywhere that my mind is bound and, and not free, it just creates drastic pain in my life. So um, if, if you are holding the mental mindset that you need an idea to start a company and you're just searching for an idea, you're not free. Um, if you're holding the idea that you need money and lots of it or even tens of thousands of it to start a company and you can't start until you have that, and you have that feeling you're not free. And if you have the feeling that you uh, need to be an expert or you need to have credibility or some sort of designation like a PhD in order to start a company, yeah, you're not, you're not free either. Um, so freedom is really just like freedom to, to have abundance. And if you examine every area of your life, like financial, uh, relation, relationships with friends, intimate relationships, family, any area that's not abundant, there's some kink in your mindset that's that's um, that that you're not even aware of that's keeping that abundance from you. So if you don't have the money that you want, if you don't have the amount of women or men in your life, if you're looking for that that you want, if you don't have the quality of uh, of friendships that you want, that there's there's something in your mind. And if your family connections aren't aren't there, there might be more to that. But the full concept of abundance and freedom to have abundance and not having it because there's a block that you're not even aware of is, is, is really deeply fascinating to me. And when I created the very first foundation, people were like, Dane, I don't have an idea. I was like, cool, let me show you how to do that. You don't need an idea. They're like, Dane, I don't have money. He's like, cool, you don't need money. Let me show you how to do that. They're like, Dane, I'm not an expert. Folks, you don't need to be an expert. Let me show you how to do that too. So the foundation was really just a, a, a symbol for abundance. Wow. Dude, this is deep, man. You're going deep. You're going deep here. <laughs> so, what else? with that in mind, like the customer development questions, like totally no, 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 that, no, no, what, no, no. So, then, what other questions are they asking you? I mean, those are the the big roadblocks, right? The funding, the product idea, and you mentioned the expertise. Uh, I mean, you don't have to list them, but do they do people find a, a whole slew of other things that are they are these like oh. kind of fictional roadblocks or? Or you know, yeah. sort of mental roadblocks. No, not, not actually. That's no, it. That's it. <laughs> the, we out just, of business. Those are just big ones. Uh, but it, there's always there's always stuff that comes up that, that holds people back. But ultimately, what it is, it's a, it's a belief that they have about the world, and it's 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 their way of looking at reality. And some people have the reality of like, oh, it takes money to make money. Like I have to I have to have money to start a business. That is their reality, and that is their belief. Uh, right. But what the the reason that having coaches and a community of people around you is so important is because you get to see other people's perspectives and other people's realities and we're so you know all of us are so locked into what we're seeing in the world as being true that we need other people to sh to uh to show us where we're off because sometimes what we believe to be true isn't necessarily true 
And so to answer your question, we have people asking those questions all the time. There's all sorts of roadblocks that come up, but it's generally not the roadblock that they think that it is. <laughs> Never. Ever. <laughs> it's yeah. something else. Interesting. Wow. So uh, I think like the the student will be like, Dane, uh, I need help with my idea extraction. I'm I'm going to ask all the questions you're giving me to ask, but it's just not working. Um, what am I doing wrong? And then I find out that like age 18, he was a tennis instructor and he was trying to learn how to serve and he had the whole team watching him screw up like five serves so whenever he's doing something he doesn't know how to do he's terrified of being completely ridiculed by community and that's he didn't even know that event or incident was present for him while he was doing like customer extraction so once we went into that process and released him so he was free from that trauma then he was able to go and pursue idea extraction so oh I'm not having trouble with these questions oh crap let's go back to age 18 when you were playing tennis how did you discuss, um, just to get into that, uh, did, were you like uh, on the other line or did he three-way you in and you were listening to him or how, how did you figure this out? <laughs> how bad do we want to freak people out on the, <laughs> on the call? Yeah, I used a couple different methods uh, of like kind of intuitively diving in but... Um, it, it starts with understanding like where beliefs come from. And beliefs all come from our past experiences. Mm -hmm. So like, well, what happens is you have an experience, and this experience happens, and then you create a belief around this experience. And then this belief becomes your model of the world. And so uh, when, we, when we see people that keep running up against some sort of issue or some sort of thing in their lives, we start, expo start asking questions around what are the beliefs that they have, what are the thoughts that are going through their mind when it comes to whatever it is that they're trying to get. And then you trace those thoughts back to like, oh, well, when when was the time when you started thinking this? Okay. Does that make Absolutely. sense? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you're doing like student development at the same time. Uh, what do you mean yeah. by student development? Well, I, I was termed the word development as interviews, as sort of questioning, deep questioning. And in this case, he's having problems talking or, you know, extracting ideas from his target market. And, this, and his nervousness or whatever the issues were were related to this tennis incident. And you guys obviously intuitively or just outwardly just asked him like, "Why are you so nervous?" Oh, I don't know. And then oh, tell uh, one of your things, right? Tell us more. Tell me more. <laughs> tell me more. Uh, well, I had this tennis thing. I, I I don't know how it went, but you know, I'm assuming it's something like that, right? The ten the tension of like, ah, I don't know, is definitely there, and it just takes a very loving, gentle, compassionate person on the other line, just just kind of asking questions to kind of rewire to the part of the mind that was either shut off or or however that works. Mm -hmm. You know, have you been like this forever? You know, were you like this when you were 15? Well, I don't think so. Well, when did it shift for you? How old were you? I don't know. 16? No. 17? No, eight, 18. Maybe 18. Like, you know, you really guide them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I love your smile. Yeah, right now. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. pretty it's the real stuff. So people come to us because they want to build a software company to have just a lot of money business kind of thing. Right. But I, this is I, I don't I don't personally care nearly as much if you get a software company out of the foundation at the price of not becoming emotionally free. Uh, so yeah, so like uh, what what happens when you're when you're doing the work at the level of beliefs? Um, it's, it's almost the deepest level of work you can do. And so if you make one little shift in your beliefs, you see a ripple effect throughout everything in your life because that belief was running him in his, when he's trying to start a business, uh, in his relationships, when he's you know, trying to be healthy. That belief is running throughout everything. And so you make one little shift in the belief and then you see a completely um, different shift in all areas of your life from it. Wow. Yeah. So these students, more than just uh, answering these individual questions for them or helping guide them to the answer, you know, once they've uh, you know solved that problem in their life, do do they start start to unlock that and realize how they can apply that to other areas of their life, or you know, more than just uh, you know back, coming back to each question and problem down the road? Uh, it sounds like you're training them to understand the source of the problems and not just look for you know you know textbook problem solutions. Yeah, it's it's is what what we're doing is we're treating um, the root cause, not treating symptoms. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, um, many entrepreneurs we've talked to, you know, one of the big hangups is of course um, customer development, really getting out the door, getting out the building. Especially uh, a lot of guys that are sitting behind their computers. Uh, the cold calling, you know, and actually talking to their market is uh, scary, and uh, rejection. 
fear from you know fear of rejection is a big one. Uh, I, I feel it myself. Uh, is is Dane and his team going to answer this cold email? Uh, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Uh, just when I was starting this podcast, uh, I was startled uh, because I thought, oh, well, nobody's going to really respond to me. They don't know who I am. Uh, but I was surprised at, at how many people did. And so now that belief that I had, my own internal limiting belief, has now started to change. Uh, mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, uh, so... Congratulations. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> you crossed a, a chasm that many people never do. Listen, man, it's just email. They're not going to come after me. Uh, and, I can, <laughs> and I can hide if they do, you know. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of hang-ups, man. Uh, I don't know how to code. Uh, this JavaScript looks kind of crazy. Uh, but uh, little by little, you start figuring this stuff out. And um, sometimes you do get blocked. I remember when I was trying to learn Rails, I got really blocked, and I just kind of gave up on it. Uh, but... Um, it helps to have the, that community and actual physical people, you know, beyond just the blogs and beyond just the videos uh, that you're actually meeting with and having that community. It's, it's, I don't think there's any way to substitute it, actually. Maybe this is. Maybe video conferencing is well, getting closer to it. Just, and just to be clear, the, uh, the foundation program is all virtual. So, so a oh. lot of people last year, uh, they, they didn't join because they thought that uh, they, thought we, they had to come to one spot. And oh, yeah. Have, That's what we, I thought. We have a lot of... We have a lot of footage from live events because we host a party at the end for all of our top students, okay. uh, and that's where the footage really comes from. But but we do it all virtual, and everything is done via Google Hangout, via Skype, via chat rooms online. Okay. Um, like we said, it's really about having the emotional like support of a group of people. The physical, like being in in physical proximity, is awesome too. But uh, it's just creating that community online is wow. what we're focused. That's impressive. I mean, there's a lot of startups like Meetup and some others trying to do, you know, get people online, offline. Um, it's really powerful. What sort of uh, geographic locations are you seeing people connect from? All over the world. Over over 30 percent of our community is from outside the U.S. Uh, so literally from New Zealand to the Netherlands to Romania, Mexico, Mexico, Canada, U.S. All over. Awesome. South American markets. Kick ass. Yeah, uh, we've we've been here in Brazil. What do you guys got to tell uh, tips for us? We had a couple of students from Brazil, but I don't know that they ever got any traction on anything. Yeah, uh, that so doesn't mean that Brazil's not good. I don't think. Okay, where else then? What's that? Where else in South America? Anywhere in particular? No, just like markets that are like ten years behind the U.S. Yeah, yeah. like uh, people are going into pay per click. In, oh, yeah. in Hispanic markets, and they're getting like ten cent clicks. Where in the U.S., they're like a dollar. So convert right. your stuff to Espanol. Right. Yeah. Right. Lower your ad cost by ninety percent. Right. Right. So, um, you know, now that we've talked a little about the the freedom and some of the emotional hangups people have, uh, let, let's get into the just the process itself, uh, the customer development. Uh, let, can you share with us some great questions that you found really unlock? Um, uh, key ideas, uh, the idea extraction process? Yes. Yes. And I'll share probably the very best one that I have not ever shared publicly. All right. And, and this process, you got to be pretty stupid to not be able to make this process work. <laughs> um, Crap, I hope people I hope people are able to make this work. <laughs> Look, I'm not calling you stupid. I'm taking it back. I'm taking it back. Right. If you're not doing it, it's probably because I didn't do a good job teaching it. All right, fair enough, fair enough. I like that. So um, if you want to just kind of, you know, so you, so you think that, you know, to start a business, in order to start a business, you need an idea. Um, but really, um, starting a business is about solving problems and, and finding pain. So if you just make your business about finding and excavating and searching for problems, then you'll have all the ideas you could ever dream of starting. So with that in mind, um, the mindset is you're looking for problems, you're looking for pain. Uh, where is there just a list of problems that, or, or pain that people, that's just like waiting for people to experience on a day-to-day basis? And think about the software tools that people use that they experience pain with. And typically the big ones that come up are like Microsoft Excel or email. 
So you can go into different businesses and ask them, hey, what are you using Excel for? Mm -hmm. And you'll find out they've got all these complicated like formulas and graphs to chart all this stuff, and then you're like, would you like that turned into software? And they'll be like, oh, yeah. Um, so that's one real, real simple, concrete way to go get a remarkable idea. Was that Carl? Who, who I don't know if Carl did it, but I wouldn't be surprised. I couldn't remember it. There's somebody that that was the question that led. Yes, to... they were using Excel. Yeah. Do you That's know what I'm all. saying? No. The the second thing uh, that I that I like that really is kind of exciting for me to think about is, um, you know, just just if you want to get your feet wet with idea extraction, just remember what you're doing is you're finding pain. So, uh, any of the fear of rejection that you have, or the trepidation with your credibility. Or just the emotional thing that you know that uh, you said you felt like I feel that rejection too, and I, I personally feel it in my stomach. I'm like, oh god, I don't want to, have to get up on this computer and go talk to people. Like, I feel that same thing too. Do you? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. It's big time. It's not like it's not there for us. Um, but you know, call up a friend or a family member, or if you have an uncle or some relative that you know that's running a business, just call them up and ask. Tell them you're looking for business ideas and you want to ask them some questions to see if you can find any. And then make sure and make great. Open up your email inbox and go down your last 10 or 15 emails and just tell me what those 10 or 15 emails are related to. And the person's going to be like, oh, this is for a shipping order, this is for vendors, this is for inventory, this is for da 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 da. And you're like, which one of those emails like, do you just not want to open and not have to deal with? And you'll be like, oh gosh, this inventory thing is just such a pain. Like, well, how, you know, how are you managing that inventory? Uh, you know, oh, well, we do blah 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 blah, and then you, know, you can you just naturally you'll probably see the progression pro progress into some sort of kick-ass product you could develop to solve that pain for them. Wow, wow. that's great! You could probably use that for just about any business, right? Or uh, you can walk up to anyone with a business and ask them that. It doesn't have to be a particular vertical or size. Totally, it's really fun to do too. So uh, yeah. so now so now that we've got a couple of interesting open-ended questions out of the way, uh, and you get to a little bit of their pain, how, where, how do you how do you take that pain and start wire? Or do you start wireframing up stuff? I mean, how do you like get that to the software bit? Huh. Do you do you write it? Do you, do you put together like a paper outline or something and email them? Say, Is, are you, would this help? And and you know what I mean? So I'm assuming a lot of your students aren't software developers by trade. Good question. So typically, like the simplest way to explain it in a short interview is you want to get to a wireframe, uh, and you but you want to get to an intent to purchase before a wireframe. And then once you have intent to purchase, like, yeah, I would definitely pay for that if you solve my problem. I don't need to see a wireframe. I just know I don't like this problem. And yes, I would pay for it if you built something. They don't give money yet, but there's a really strong intent to purchase. Then I would do a wireframe. Um, then I would, but the first I would say, great. So you know, the famous heat and shock, Kissmetrics question. If you could wave a magic wand and do anything related to this problem to solve it, what would that look like for you? And then you just let them create your product for you. Um, and just list out everything you got, and um, then just Google search how to design UI, how to draw UI on sheets of paper. It's not too hard. It's it's actually really fun. It's it's kind of kind of like nerve-wracking at first, but then you just have a sheet of paper and you just look at like, you know, you go look at what other user interfaces look like and you just kind of start copying them and in less than a day or two you've usually got something pretty ugly that works. Um, and that's then the next step beyond that is to then, well, Andy's the expert at this part. Pre-selling, uh, showing, them, showing them exactly what it's going to be and how it's going to function and uh, put, we teach people to put, to put together a founding members program and so for, for the first five people or first ten people, they can buy in where they pay for a year in advance or some sort of some sort of special offer that makes them uh, a special founding members, and then you get them to pay for it up front before it exists. Uh, so that way you don't have to waste any time or money building something that people may or may not pay for. And, and part of this, you know, part of this was born out of necessity, right? Like not having money to actually build stuff. But really what you're doing here is you're validating is this something that people badly want? Like that's what you're finding out. Because what happens when you ask for money is you get to the real objection. Because people might say, "Oh yeah, I would definitely pay for that. That sounds awesome." Just because they're being nice, <laughs> yeah. and they don't want to hurt yeah. you. 
and right. would say, okay, that's great. It'll be uh, it's going to be fifty dollars a month. Would you like to pay for the first three months now? Or and then they'll be like, well, you know, it doesn't really have the thing that I'm looking. And that's when you get to like what yeah. the real objections are. So that's why you want to ask for money as quickly, like once you're at a point where you have like a model and working and stuff. But you want to ask for money before you build it. Yeah, and we we tell people that if you write code before you've got money. We kick you out of the foundation. Now we uh, haven't had that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so badass. Uh, and, and from a developer perspective, Jeff, that's got to be so strange, right? Yeah. You just want to go right in the coding. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff yeah, it's like tell us. Tell, tell me, I didn't know you're. I didn't know you're a developer. Tell us. Tell me. What do you think of that? When you hear that? Um, well, yeah, it sounds insane. I mean, well, <laughs> it makes sense. I, I think your process is right on, and fundamentally, you're right. And from you know all the interviews we've done, take uh, getting a credit card or charging your customers as soon as possible uh, is the only way to get real feedback. Um, you know, people will tell you, "Yeah, that sounds great. I'm uh, sure. Yeah, I'll sign up for that." But it seems like uh, you know the difference maker is the you know the payment, um, the holy holy transaction from one person to another. Um, and furthermore, that you get better feedback from them once they're paying as well, right? Um, like even like if you had a freemium product. Um, giving it away, you don't get the same feedback as if they're paying for using the product. So it makes sense to get it up front just to save you time and effort uh, from that poor feedback if, if for one thing alone. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really cool. We're actually going through this process right now ourselves, building a software product. And uh, we're, we're just... Which is good, right, because we teach how to build yeah. software. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're actually following the framework that we teach. Um, yeah. And we're, we're talking with customers now, and it's... It's really what's really cool is bringing them in on the ground floor. They actually feel this. Uh, you feel this like sense of connection towards each other, like you're creating something together. It's a neat experience to go through. Yeah, it's also really neat to have a partner. Like I, I really love this guy. He's amazing. Really too bad. And so he, he he's been he's been a great great uh, great friend in my life. So that's cool. Thank you. Not yeah. meaning to be emotional on purpose here. <laughs> Uh, but if you, uh, if, to give you an example, um, you could pre-sell us right now, um, and we would give you money right now for a pain that we have that I could just give you. Sure, let's and hear it. So, um, <laughs> here, please make this <laughs> make this product for me. I will give you money. Like this is this is seriously what what can happen. Uh, okay. We we use OfficeAutopilot.com, and it's all of our marketing and our sales platform. And then we have QuickBooks.com and or QuickBooks, and but they don't fucking talk to each other. Yeah. And so, you know, I'd give you 50, maybe 100 bucks a month if you could just link my Office Autopilot account up to my QuickBooks account. And you just create a nice little software product for that. You know what? You could probably build that in less than 12 weeks. And there are like 5,000 some uh, Office Autopilot customers that you'd immediately get in front of to sell that product to. And this kind of moves us into the super hybrid of like ninja, ninja type businesses to build, which is building a business uh, off the API model. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to build, you typically want to get a software product to market in like 12 weeks. And it's 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 a, it's challenging to do if you're building a product that stands on its own, although it is possible if you follow our framework. But even if, not but, and in addition, if you build a product like on top of an API, then you can really build a product pretty quick and make a decent chunk of change. This nice little lifestyle business building software on top of APIs like uh, Office Autopilot to QuickBooks integration. Or if you were able to cut, talk to attorneys who use Dropbox in some certain way and they're really hacking their folders together, oh, let's build you a nice little app that actually streamlines a little bit more about how you're using Dropbox on top of their API. Um, that's where you get into like even more like, oh, like an, Jeff, as a developer, do you kind of feel like more free and expanded as I talk about the simplicity of this concept? Yeah, it definitely sounds like, you know, honestly, one of the first things I told him when I worked with him back in the day was I don't love programming. You know, it's sort of a means to an end, which is I love creating web applications and products. Um, but I think your strategy is definitely focusing on the product and the problem and, you know, less on the code and the bits, which is, uh, you know, definitely a weight off, uh, you know, programming that, you know, Plus engineering stress. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear, hear you say, um, if you could, I don't know if it, if it was unconscious or not, but you said product and problem, but if you can always just put problem ahead of product. Um, what we find is, and what I find is that if I'm focused on product instead of the problem I'm solving, 
Um, then like I get really married to this product, and then like it has to work, and I put it a square into a circle hole. Yeah. But if I'm just back, like wait, 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 what is this problem solving? Yeah. Or what is this product solving? What problem is it solving? And we focus on that. I'm willing to completely trash this product over here because I am up to some cool things in this world, and that includes removing this problem from the world. Um, that really, it can be, it can suck if you have to like pivot and whatnot. But if if you just Especially in developer speak, I notice it's typically product problem instead of problem product. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Developers are always looking at the tools they have and how they can use them to build some cool, crazy thing rather than <laughs> looking for an actual problem that needs solving with these cool, creative tools. Uh, so it's sort of a, a pro, you know problem I've got, I guess, coming from such an entrenched uh, developer background. But I, 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 I don't think that's specific to developers. What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, you're starting to open my eyes, though. Change my way of looking at it. Oh, good, man. Good. Well, it's Friday, so. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, uh, you know, I really love the fact that you guys are doing this virtually. I don't know why, but I always got the impression this is like a physical thing that like you guys are all doing. I know, this dude. Together. This was like, we it's, it's, found this out just like just recently, and I, I was interviewing a guy for the Starting From Nothing podcast, and he, t he, was, he was a guy who used our pre-launch videos last year. We put five videos out and uh, just incredible training videos. And he used those and that framework to build a business from it. It's doing like three grand a month right now. Um, oh, and so cool. um, it was something similar to uh, Sam's, like a snap and sec, uh, like a uh, picture uploading thing for a specific niche. What niche do you know? I can't remember. Oh, cool. Um, but he... Uh, but I, at one point in the interview, I was like, well, dude, why didn't you join the foundation just out of curiosity? He's like, oh, I, I couldn't travel to the, the United States. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, you, you didn't have to. And then and then we found out this is actually a really big objection from a lot of people. So, yeah, it's all virtual, and it's awesome. <laughs> well, you know, it, you guys have this awesome video on, on your site, and it looks like you guys are all sitting around together. <laughs> well, what's what we do? We do just sit around, but we're just not. We're virtual. I that's, know, that's but the party I, at the end. But but yeah. that's what I'm saying is I saw that and I'm like, oh, I, I got to go to this big house where they're all hanging out. Oh, uh, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. it's visually, it you guys are a little bit, uh, it it feels a little bit like a physical thing as opposed to a virtual. Yeah, thing. With so, a physical thing at the end. Yeah. This is so, the marketing error on our part. Yeah. Um, we screwed this up as marketers, and typically the things you screw up in marketing are are the very obvious things. Uh, like, oh, um, can I put my credit card in the site or do I have to send you a check? You didn't tell me anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, five seconds in that video could have been like, um, I invited him to this mansion and I come on, I come on screen for a second, oh, by the way, the foundation is completely virtual. We just meet up at the end of it. <laughs> Back to the video. Like, <laughs> okay. We're good. Like yeah. three or four seconds corrects that objection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, tell us, uh, like, let's say I'm excited about what you guys are doing. Well, how much does it cost, and how long does it last? I know you mentioned something like three months earlier. Six months. Six, Six months. months. Six months. Okay. How often do I check in? How, how does it give us a little bit of the nitty gritty? If it was three months, we would run the risk of not getting to completely reprogram your mind. Uh, I think re my mental reprogramming happens. I don't know. If you if you hang around a foreign country for a long enough period of time, you start to kind of pick up the accent, if you will. Yeah. yeah I don't know what accent that was, but you you, you pick up the accent after the, accent. the accent. accent. And but what what you don't know is that's not con you're not consciously picking that up. That's actually picked up subconsciously from total immersion in a community. Um, so I don't know if it's three months or six months, maybe three, but we find that six months is of total immersion for an entrepreneur to be in our community to completely like start to look at the world through a different set of lenses. Yeah, and you have to immerse yourself. Like, so we find that so many people just kind of dabble in things and kind of commit 80% to all of the little things they're doing, but they never actually like put a stake in the ground and put 100% commitment in towards something. And we find that the people that do are the people who make crazy amounts of progress in a short period of time because they're a hundred percent in and and having a six-month commitment is is a it's a big one um, and the financial commitment is is a significant one as as well not necessarily if you compare it to other things like if you look at I spent I spent like 85 grand on college like 
eighty-five grand, and it taught me not as much as I would have expected to invest eighty-five grand in something. It taught you how to spend twenty years paying it back. Yeah, that's what it taught me. Working for somebody else, and uh, and we see other programs out there. There are programs out there that are charging like eight to twelve grand just to teach people how to code, to go through a coding school, to learn Ruby on Rails, to get uh, you know a job paying one hundred and fifty grand a year. Right. Uh, so. Knowing all of that, the, the the foundation is priced at three three grand, six grand, and twelve grand based off of the tiers that people want to join. Gotcha. The majority of people will be in the middle tier, and and the reason they join the middle tier is because the middle tier you get a bunch of one on one coaching and an accountability coach to hold you to make sure that you know they're checking in with you every single week, um, and you're able to access all of our mentors that are in the foundation so that you get personal one on one help. You get awareness block bashing. Gotcha. Gotcha. I love that accountability coaches. That's 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 fantastic. How off? How much time a week is our normal students spending? Can is this something they can? Have? Yeah. I not normal. You know, uh, people that actually you know get something out of the out of the uh, the experience. You know, not dabblers. Yeah. Um, this is a, an inspiring, exciting answer. Yeah. Uh, so one of our top students. Uh, Carl Mattiola, you'll see some interviews coming up with him. He uh, he was working at Tesla. Uh, he quit his job in July of this year because of uh, the software product that he built over the course of the six months. And when he joined, he had no idea what he was going to do. Yeah, last November he had no idea for a business. And he was one of those people. He was like, I've tried, I've tried the courses and stuff. Like, screw it. This is the one I'm committing to, and I'm doing it. And that was his mentality going in. Cool. Uh, he was working between. 40 and 60, 70 hour weeks at Tesla. Like at one point he was working directly under Elon, so like a really intense job. And right. he committed he committed to two hours a day. Is it two hours a day or one hour a day? One. One hour a day. Um, two max. Yeah. Say one hour of we'll action say, per day. We'll say two hours a day. Uh, gotcha. Two hours a day, 10 hours a week is what he committed to. And they were just focused though. Like no messing around, like two hours of focused time. Right. And he went from having no idea to... I think he was doing about three grand a month in May. Uh, yeah, he started clinicmetrics.com. Okay. Yeah. Pull, you can pull, pull it up on the yeah. Board. Yeah, Jeff, can you pull that up? Yeah. And uh, and yeah, and and so so two hours a day, and that that's what's possible. And and a lot of people are asking, do I need to do this full time, yeah, or how yeah. much time do I need yeah. to actually put into it? It's not really about the time; it's about what are you committed to as a person. What are you committed? But to but, but but you know what, Andy? To be honest with you, man, it, it honest. Commitment's one thing, but you really half the time you just—I mean, all of the time—you really got to buckle down and actually do the work. And so when yeah. you say the one to two hours, uh, that's cool. I'm I'm happy to hear that that really you can have a full time job and do this. And this guy, yeah, you have to do the that. work, but but uh, commitment is an order of priorities. Like, what are your priorities in your life? Like, well, uh, I, Jeff and I, you know, we we speak to a lot of entrepreneurs. A lot of them sort of have. I got this little, you know, my little savings. I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to do this full time. That's usually not an option for a lot of people. Yeah, um, I agree. And so, f this is a great example. This guy's able to do it while having a job under Elon. I mean, it, working at Tesla. That, that's a. I, mean, I imagine that's not a cakewalk. You know, that's probably a real job. <laughs> no, so scroll a, down a little bit, and you'll see the screenshot for this product. Uh, right here, so you got patient visits, arrival rate, new patients, and then visits per evaluation. Uh, so he's like, what are you guys using Excel for in your business? That's actually, like, well, he didn't actually ask that question directly, but he found out they were using Excel, and he found a large majority of physical therapy practices using Excel, because there wasn't really a simple tool to use. Right. So how does Carl design it? What does he do? Well, he asks them, what are, like, Say the four most important things you guys want to see. Oh, patient visits. Oh, arrival rate. Oh, new patients. Oh, visits per eval. Cool. Like, there's no guesswork at all. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, you make it sound so easy. Uh, well, it's it's freaking. I don't know. It is simple, but like, I don't know not, why. It's not easy. It's not easy, but it's simple. Like, okay, simple. Yeah. Fair, enough. It, Fair enough. It's. It really truly really is. You know, just like completely simple. On my Facebook page, you'll see. Oh, since my birthday was recently, you'll see this one lady's like, oh my gosh, happy birthday, Dane. Thank you for having the wisdom to create paperlesspipeline.com. And I just laughed. I was like, this is awesome. I didn't have wisdom to create Paperless Pipeline. I asked a few freaking questions. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, interesting to me, like coming from, again, my, my point of view, um, 
what the simple is it almost more simple when you're not solving your own problem like we always say like solving your own problems are, are great but often that like you clutter yourself with baggage potentially and you know maybe it's harder to prioritize because what you guys are also saying is prioritization is everything and that's so difficult even just to know how to you know how to prioritize the features there's pros and cons to each um. I, ideally, if if you can solve your own problem and you don't have to talk to anybody to solve it, but you can get pre-sales, like that would be like the ultimate dream. Like who wouldn't want that? Yeah. Uh, but when I got started, like I was 22 and I didn't even have any problems. I, like, what do, I don't have problems. Like I don't have I don't have any success to have problems. With. You know, the more successful you are, the more problems you have. Mm, so. Like, go after the successful people. Like, if you're afraid of successful people, no, just start asking them about their problems. They will just be like, oh, my God, I've got lots of them. And then you're like, oh, this is just a normal dude. Like, go to the conferences and the guys that are doing millions of dollars a month be like, hey, man, so what's it like to run a multiple million dollar business? What are some of the problems you face? And then just sit down for a few days and listen. Wow. So, so let's get into this with uh, Carl. So... Carl uh, did this for six months. Um, <laughs> Clinicmetrics.com is uh, is the output here. Um, in your opinion, um, what what were some of the early stumbles Carl went to? I mean, did did he did he have any problems with the development aspects of it? How did he get the the development done while still working at Tesla? Do you know the answer to that? Mm -hmm. It's pretty smooth sailing for Carl. I don't know who his developer was. Uh, I know he used pre-sales, sold the product in advance to, to fund the development of the product. You know, you're not building the product yourself. What you're doing is you're sp that one or two hours a day is spent interacting with customers. Right. The other time when you're not working, you have people that you've hired to build your product for you. Okay. Okay, so let's, j let's again, back to the tactics. So he's coming home, you know, he's had a full day at Tesla. He's thinking, oh man, I gotta, I gotta get on this. Uh, let me just take a quick a little refresher, and then he gets on the phone. Does he start emailing? What's some of the like tactics of getting a hold of these people? Initial email, set up to a phone call. Carl, Carl met a guy at a at a live event, um, but he went to a trade show or something. He actually went to a physical therapy trade show. Yeah. Oh, okay. And he got in touch with a guy who is. I can't remember what he was. Um, he uh, <laughs> he uh, he got in touch with a guy who is marketing stuff to physical therapists, and okay. the guy really helped him out with like just getting started with the idea or something. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> she might bark. No worries, no worries. Yeah, so he went to this. Uh, se he went to a convention or. Uh, you know, you should you should you should get Carl on here to tell his story because we're just not doing it justice. Yeah. Um, we can set that up. I would love that. Yeah, I would totally love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We'll get that hooked up. He's he's yeah. actually flying. He's he, he'll be here in like an hour. Yeah. <laughs> so if we're doing this like two hours later, we just have him come on. Yeah. But uh, right. cool. yeah, you should hear his story. It's pretty incredible. It, it's funny because he uh, he talked about how he was he, he was going to into his second pre-sale or something, and he's on the phone with a guy who had emailed an hour before it. And the guy who he's just talking to convinces him in that moment to double his prices, and then in his pre-sale he doubled his prices and landed the deal. Like it's Whoa. crazy stuff. Um, wow. Carl wow. is hilarious because when you interview him, uh, it'll be fun to watch because Carl doesn't really show any emotion, and he'll be like, "In Vegas, in Vegas, we uh, we had a coaching session. At the end of it, that's when he decided to quit his job at Tesla." And he comes out to the room, and you know, a room of 30 people there, and he's like, all right, guys, in four weeks, I'm putting my two weeks notice in. And everybody starts cheering and stuff. We're like, Carl, how do you feel? He's like, I feel pretty excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like monotone buzz. Monotone, like, right, right. Yeah, totally. He's incredible, wow. though. That's great, man. Uh, that's, that's really great. It's incredible stories. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is there any cool. other um, examples you can, that we can pull up? It's Jordy's website. Guestretain.com. Guest retain. Retain? Yeah, I think so. Okay. okay. Tired yep. of worrying about your TripAdvisor reviews. Okay. 
Huh. Honestly, stay in touch with guests and take control of your online reputation. Wow, this is a cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, I so, guess who uh, came up with it? Not him. <laughs> ah, right. <laughs> All right, so uh, walk us through this one. Oh, cool. He's got a typo under customer service. Excelnet. <laughs> and he's still making money. Look at that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He just, this is the South American market guy. Okay. So uh, he contacted uh, hotels in South American markets, and they, like, all really their online reputation, like, if they got a bad TripAdvisor review, it would totally kill their bookings. Right. So. He's like, so what are some painful things that you're experiencing? They're like, oh god, our reputa online reputation. If if it, a bad review, it totally crushes us. Right. I can see this being applied to restaurants, all kinds of stuff. You know, those reputation management is a big deal these days. Yeah, he's he's doing really well with spas, as well. Okay. You know, I have to tell you, man, you guys are like. Uh, Seeing this happen, helping your students out, it's got to feel so good to have like a formula that works, not a, not like a quick get rich quick scheme scam. You know, it, <laughs> this is like for, this is like a, the real deal. I I just there are a lot of uh, you know there's just so many of those guys online. I'm just it's it's exciting yeah. to see this. Yeah, this actually works. It, it, believe it or not. Yeah, it's cr it's crazy, right? Like, uh, notice how the light bulb flipped for him when he saw the two examples. Yeah, is that what you is that what you made crystal clear for you? Uh, no, I you know I, when I've, I I'm bi I'm a big fan of Mixergy, and when uh, day when you went on, I just I, I think usually I listen to Mixergy when I'm having my lunch, and I just I remember just taking a bite of, and just hearing you, and I just couldn't finish my food. I was just got, I was so arrested, uh, and I was like, God, wow, this is this guy's like doing it like. You know, because I, honestly, uh, you kind of like you're waiting for that big idea. You're just like waiting for this. Oh, I just got this great idea. You know, and yeah. and you're just waiting for this idea, and it's sometimes it just doesn't come. Yeah. And and when it comes, it not everybody wants you to solve that idea. Nobody's gonna. Maybe some people won't pay for it. And I don't know, man. It just when you said uh, when you went on and said uh, what you said, it just totally like holy shit. It was a holy shit aha moment for me. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, cool, man. Yeah. yeah, it feels really good. We're like, if we, we we put this in our marketing as much as possible. If you're looking for a get rich quick scheme, like something to make money quickly, and just like this isn't it. Like it's for people who want to build legitimate businesses and put yeah. the time and energy and effort. Because like like you said, it it takes it takes time and it takes commitment and it takes a lot of energy of doing the work. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't even like saying that anymore because you know who says that? The people that are selling get rich quick schemes. <laughs> this is a get rich quick scheme that I'm selling. Right, right. Like, now you you know you can get rich quick if you consider rich like or quick like a year. Um, you know, Sam went from like five hundred dollars in the bank to over a hundred grand in the bank within a year. And that's in the bank, not even like including the like you know a lot can happen in a year. So like get rich quick like you can. When you get to a certain level, you make money very quickly, like rapidly. Like tens of thousands of dollars per day is not uncommon um, in the circles that I run in. And so it's, but you know, it took years to get there. The way that I would describe the foundation is like if you want to create a remarkable product and leave a legacy, like this is definitely, and you want it to be, and, it's, and, and, you're, and you're knowing that it's going to be very hard. And it's going to be very hard because not because the program is hard, but because the emotions that come up for you are, are very difficult. Uh, and please, but like you know that facing those emotions is going to open you up to every other area of your life, you know, better relationships with your friends and family because of it, come on in, man. Yeah, that's such a different message than what uh, Moore might be used to with the get rich quick, you know, ad totally. sequence. But <laughs> that's you said that. Yeah, that's what the fucking dudes say. It pisses me off. <laughs> this program isn't for you if you can't work hard. <laughs> this program is... God, you, just shut up. If you hate puppies and love <laughs> terrorism, yeah, program's not for you. No, I, I, you know, I'm a, I consider myself a bit of a technologist, and you know, you, you see these cool, you know, read about all these cool technology, and you kind of, you get kind of caught in like, ah, oh, this is really cool, you know, and, and you get caught in the this is really cool as opposed to, what are these, what's the big problems that these guys are having, and, and you know, what, what are the frustrations, and it just when you started with that, tell me more, the whole just wait for it, and then. 
tell me more. Uh, the whole swing pool idea extraction that you did with him again, and I just, I don't know, man, it just, it just got me thinking, like, you know, this is, this is really what it's about, you know, solving I, real yeah. problems. This is really what long-term business, you know, Steve Jobs yeah. back in the 80s, I want a slate, you know, I want that, you know, I want a tablet that is interactive or whatever, you know, people solving real problems, you know. You know, if I had to start all over again, um, I would be slightly nervous, but really, like, basically boatloads of excitement. Um, and what I would do if I started o all over again is I would look at all of the most successful students in the foundation and as a reminder that business is really about finding the pain and solving problems. Because even though I preach this, it's very seductive and easy to get sucked into cool. Yeah. So what I would be doing is I would like a guest retainer and be like, wow, damn, this is cool. Oh yeah, all you gotta do is find the pain. So like my, my mind's doing the same thing as you uh, when, when I look at that stuff. Yeah. And, and you know, and Jeff, uh, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I, I, I look at Hacker News. I'm on TechCrunch looking at all these cool things, whiz-bang stuff. And uh, you know, it just Cool, and sometimes the big startup monies, uh, the fundraisers, and all that stuff kind of gets you off. At least for me, get me off track. But hell, man, uh, three, five grand a month—that's that's great. That is awesome. Yeah, you know, and I want to mention too, you guys, the products that people are making. These entrepreneurs are like solving people's problems, making their lives better as well, right? By alleviating some daily uh, stressor or pressure. So, I mean, it's just really important. Like coming back to where I uh, my approach with technology has always been kind of like why are these things so shitty you know the, the the our interface with technology every day they're incredibly powerful tools uh, or machines I should say but we just haven't built the tools to like use them properly yet and I think you guys are kinda you know biting off the, the little tiny chunks uh, bite-sized pieces that people can actually apply every day uh, to their lives you know make these make the technology suck less yeah more practical Amen. Yeah, which is a big fundamental shift uh, for a lot of people, you know, that are using Excel every day to, you know, make their lives more difficult. You, you know, can I uh, can I share one big problem I'm having with? Maybe we could do a yeah. quick idea extraction right now. So I am having a hard fucking time staying not distracted from email and not distracted from. Notifications. I know I've read all the vlog entries. Turn off email. Do this. Do that. I just, but I always end up falling back in that same hole. Like, oh man, I'm... email, email overload is, is a real pain in the ass for me. Um, and I just have a hard time training my mind to only listen to the Tim Ferrisses of the world. Only check email twice a day or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I have a hard time with that. We have a solution. Yeah. It's tasers tied to your ball sack. <laughs> All right. Yes. You open up your email. <laughs> was say, how, do you, right. how do you break the cycle? You know, it's like uh, an emotional dependence, right? Like a lot of these Dude, things to, to get out. Dude, uh, my, my, my iPhone, it just, it, it, the devices, um, when a smartwatch comes out, I'll be pummeled by email notifications that way. Yeah, I, I, I got to somehow figure that out, man. Uh, Isn't that interesting how... Uh, you know it's not good for you, and you still do it. Right. There's a there's a lot of unconscious stuff going on. Like I'll be good for like a couple of weeks, and then something will happen, and then I'll fall back into that uh, checking my email, checking my email, checking the other account, right. checking the Twitter. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Is there anything you guys do to to track personal metrics like that to help people understand how they're behaving and unlock some of those? you know, unforeseen issues maybe, you know, you see trends, or like with Famul maybe was tracking his uh, email open rate or something, you know, had a visual representation. Mm. Um, I don't know, but there's one thing that I noticed, I, in, in April I did a 10-day uh, a, a cleanse, uh, and so you don't eat food for 10 days, and you drink the, the water with cayenne pepper and lemon and something, and mm -hmm. maple syrup, and uh, and what I noticed was that when I would go to check email or to go on Facebook, it was because I was feeling some sort of emotion internally, and I didn't want to feel it, so I wanted to go do something else to distract ah, myself. Ah. And that's 
that's what I really noticed. And so um, I would, for like a week, pay attention to when you check email, what's the catalyst causing you to do it? Like, what happened just before that? Generally, generally what happens for me is like if I'm in a flow state where I say I'm writing copy or something, I'm really into it, I'm really into it, and then I get to a point where it gets hard. And it gets hard, and I don't want to go past that, like going through that wall again. And so I'm, I just, it's like unconscious or like, oh, I'll just check email and you just go. Uh, so I would pay attention to like what are, what, are the, what are the catalysts that are causing you? Like what happens right before you check email? Uh, and I think you might find some cool stuff out. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we could probably di diagnose and help you through like a half hour, but we have got to get back to our friends. Right, right. Yeah. Well, cool. An hour. Appreciate your yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we absolutely appreciate your time. Um, if you can hook us up with uh, some of your uh, students, I'd love to get them on the show. It'd be awesome to talk to them. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll email. I'll introduce you to Dan. He's our director of partnerships. He might have been on CC'd on this and. Uh, We'll introduce you to like Carl and Jordy and a couple other people, and uh, I think they'd make great, great interviews. Sounds oh, good. Yeah. And just, and just know you're not you're not alone in that email thing. The way I broke the cycle is by traveling the world for three months, and and not being like I couldn't check email because I had no internet. And when I came back three months later, I realized that wow, a lot of these things really sort themselves out. Um, they don't need me. And so is that experiential awareness of it. So just go travel the world for three months and don't have internet <laughs> access. Perfect. But, but again, it changes your perspective, right? Like on on your uh, what you your perception of it. Yeah. Totally. I check I check email once twice a week, um, and I get people that you know in on my team that are like, Dane, come on, can you check email more? Like they're like trying to get me to check it more because I check it so little. Right. And. Yeah, I love what Andy said about the stuff before. What's going on before that has you causing to check email? First off, like get it off your phone now. Like pull up your phone and turn off email notifications on your phone. Because are you are you married? Do you have a girlfriend? Uh, yeah, I'm married. Yeah. Kids? No kids. Kids. Um, are you ever with your wife and that phone goes off and it distracts you from being present with her? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that. Turn that shit off on your phone. Like there are some mechanical things you can do right away. Like oh, yeah. get, get it off your phone. Man. Like and I actually don't want to end this. Like, you have some more freedom. This is, a place, <laughs> this is a place where you're lacking freedom. Yeah. And, and like we'd love to have you have the freedom. And the the problem with stuff like this is that it's so unconscious. We don't even know that we do it. So That's when we when we check email, well, we can't. It's hard to actually be like, oh, what just happened? Because you didn't know something negative happened. So you have to. There has to be something that breaks the pattern when you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Say, uh, there's a a. a, a extension for Chrome that you can add that blocks websites for you and so put it into Chrome only use the Chrome browser and so uh, and block your your Gmail and Facebook and every time you unconsciously click the button to go there uh, it'll stop you from going there and so it'll break the pattern and then you can see oh what just happened like what why yeah. am I doing this yeah yeah that pattern what'll come, yeah. what'll, come up, what'll come up for you then is the feeling of discomfort like you're gonna want to go check your email so you're gonna go to the button it's gonna say stop and you're like ah Oh no! Must check email. Like that's the feeling you want to breathe into. In fact, let, let me try something real quick with you. Um, so uh, sit back in your chair, close your eyes, put your hands in your lap, and uh, just think about um, this addiction you have towards email. And take a nice deep breath in through your nose. Nice. Right, do another one. Oh, that good. Yeah. Um, now picture yourself addicted to email. Like, and you just want to check your email and just tell me when you're there. Yeah, I see it. Um, if you scan your stomach, your chest, your throat, and your head, where do you feel the most energy? Stomach. On a scale of one to ten, ten being intense, how intense? I'd say a seven. Nice. That's pretty controlling. Um, put your hand on your stomach. Just breathe into your stomach for a second. If you were to give your stomach a voice, what would your stomach want to tell you right now? Relax. <laughs> <Yeah>. Relax. <laughs> Wait. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It can wait. It can wait. <clears throat> Almost like that texting campaign I've been seeing on TV. It can wait. What beautiful wisdom from your stomach. Yeah. It can wait. Couldn't be more perfectly said. Yeah. No. That's an example of emotional freedom. Mm. Wow. Well, thanks, guys. It's been uh, it's been no. Uh, <laughs> A little therapeutic as well. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Well, if, if people want to get a hold of you, uh, what's a good uh, email or how, how do people get in contact with you guys? You can, Check. You can call us at 911. <laughs> Just try, try it out. We'll pick up. It won't sound like us, but no. That's a stupid joke. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just check out the foundation.com. Uh, uh, that's probably the best place to go to to get information and to get in touch with us. Um, awesome. Yeah. For everyone that's listening that wants to sign up for the next class, you know, when does that start, or how do you guys, uh, you know, how should they approach that? Um, they they should watch the videos before they decide uh, on that. We, the next class will start at uh, November first. Okay. Um, so it's a few months out and stuff, but uh, honestly, I think the best thing, if, if, if you're interested, if you go to thefoundation.com, we've got a case study of Sam, who's our top student from last year who got interviewed on Mixergy, uh, and watching his video is very, like everything that we talked about in theory here, Andrew takes it to a very, very concrete, specific, tactical level, so that if, if some stuff's like you don't, you're not quite getting it, watch the interview with Sam and you will. Okay. Great. Sounds great. Cool. cool. Well, thanks again, guys. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Right. Really appreciate your time.